Welcome to this second Sunday in Lent. Today we're thinking about the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee and he comes to Jesus by night. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone for he himself knew what was in everyone. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3 is such a familiar passage, I thought it was worth a study. So often we think we know what something says and that's dangerous ground. Understanding John 3 actually starts at the end of chapter 2. And that's why I read those verses. In fact, what we've seen so far in John's Gospel is Jesus in conversation with individuals he has trusted with himself. They seem to be people who don't just want what he can give, but want to know who he is. There's Nathaniel, and now Nicodemus. Soon there'll be a Samaritan woman and a paralysed man, and Martha at the tomb of her brother Lazarus. He spoke truth. Jesus spoke truth that they had not known. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and hidden things which you have not known. God had invited through Jeremiah. God seems to be pursuing his strategy of working through events and encounters with people. He started off by walking with Adam in the cool of the day and spoke with Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and endless individuals. Now he's speaking with Nicodemus. The Bible is not a dry and dusty and quickly dated philosophy book or rule book or history book, although there are elements of those things in it. On the whole, the Bible comprises snapshots of God engaging with people. There's a timeless quality about that. People don't change, people are people. God demonstrates his power and glory and character in the way he engages and interacts. And for us, all this time later, recorded historical events are not imagination or invention. Well, not in this case, under the guiding hand of the truthful Holy Spirit. People have witnessed to God in their experience. Remember David Kossoff's book, A Book of Witnesses. That's what the Bible is. So here is God interacting with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, 
a leader, part of the Sanhedrin, which is a bunch of 70 people, who organised the affairs of the Jewish people in Jerusalem. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, unlike the Sadducees, who didn't. Now, the Pharisee movement was a holiness movement born in the intertestamental times between the Old and the New to preserve Israel's purity whilst being an occupied country. I mean, you don't read about Pharisees in the Old Testament, do you? When landmarks from the past that bring with them identity and security become increasingly threatened, we often chase back into the corner we know, where we've hung the pictures from the past. But by Jesus' time, Pharisees, for the most part, pursued a toxic mix of half-truth, love of status and fear of reprisals from their Roman overlords. But it wasn't all Pharisees. Nicodemus was one who'd ventured out of his corner. Was it from curiosity? Was Jesus all that the general public seemed to be claiming? Well, he decided to do his own research, maybe. Curiosity led to conversation by night. A conversation which seemed only to confuse him, but which led to his conversion. How do we know that? Well, it was Nicodemus who defended Jesus from his fellow Pharisees. They were attempting to arrest Jesus because people were believing in him. It was open knowledge that the Pharisees were trying to kill Jesus. Even the temple police refused to arrest Jesus. They were so impressed with him, thus enraging the Pharisees further. It was Nicodemus who pointed out the injustice of not giving someone a fair hearing before judgment. And his Pharisee colleagues were affronted. They said, are you also from Galilee? In other words, have you become one of his followers? And the answer was, of course, yes. Here in this nighttime conversation, Nicodemus had sought Jesus out to hear him. And as a result, he had come to believe for himself that Jesus was the Messiah. God does not reveal the treasures of truth to the casual or the careless, but to those who seek to know and to understand. It was Nicodemus who helped Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus. We find that in John 19. Now, this nighttime conversation seems to have become notorious. In chapter 7, Nicodemus is referred to as the one who had gone to Jesus before. In chapter 19, Nicodemus is referred to as the one who had first come to Jesus by night. God promises answers and insight to those who seek him wholeheartedly. He promises to be found by those who seek him. I will let you find me, he says, again through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. Sometimes we do stub our toe on hard questions, life or our Bible reading throw up, and in, instead of writing them off, superficially claiming that somehow the Bible is too old or too removed from our culture or too anything, it's better to chew them over, asking for understanding. If you walk away from a study with less insight than you brought to it, then return to it or seek help on it. What was Nicodemus seeking? He came to find answers from the one who would know. He wasn't going to form an opinion on the basis of hearsay. So this conversation takes place at night and that's significant in the mind of John, the Gospel writer. For John, creation became more defined and less formless when light was created at the start of time. Well, we all know the importance of a torch on a walk in the dark. Suddenly there's form and shape. So this isn't the neutrality of nighttime as opposed to daytime. There's a moral component to John's light and dark, day and night, blindness and seeing. Light and day and sight are all much better than dark, night and being spiritually blind. Nicodemus comes by night because he is in the dark. Remember how John starts off his gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. John lays out his canvas. 
At first, Nicodemus is confused at Jesus' reply. How can we be born again? Or, as some translations have it better, born from above. For Nicodemus, birth could only be physical, but Jesus was speaking of a different kind of birth, spiritual birth, new life, new awareness, new responsiveness, new engagement with himself and with the new society he was creating around himself. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit, he says. It's all quite clear, isn't it? And then Jesus parallels spirit with water, a picture pattern throughout scripture from the very beginning of everything, once again, when the spirit hovered over the waters. Now Jesus is only quoting prophets and the Psalms, who make the link between water and the spirit frequently. Think it through for yourself. How does water give and sustain life? So the Spirit of God comes into a person's life and there are visible signs of his presence. New shoots, new blooms, new priorities, a new sense of belonging to the society that Jesus is creating, a new love of the Bible, his word, an increasingly changed character, growth and flourishing from the inside. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, generosity, all those things in Galatians 5. Nicodemus still asks, how can these things be? Well, do you know, sometimes we just don't get to understand the mechanics of it all. It doesn't make it less true. Jesus' reply maybe seems a bit harsh. How come you don't understand? You're a teacher of Israel. Now, I don't actually think it's a criticism. You know, so often we read words spoken by God in the Bible as negatively critical when they're just deeply sad and gently challenging. I hear a different tone of voice, I think, as Jesus draws Nicodemus closer to understanding and commitment. He is treating Nicodemus with respect. There seems to be a bit of a colleagueship here. They're, after all, both teachers of Israel. Jesus again. I'm telling you this stuff from first-hand knowledge. Now at this point, there seems to be a sudden reference to the bronze serpent of Numbers 21 verse 9. It seems to be a bit of a non sequitur. Jesus seems to have switched gear here. I'm not sure that it's actually him speaking. I think the conversation with Nicodemus ends with, I have descended from heaven, so I know these things. So what's going on now? Well, remember why John's Gospel was written. These are written, he says, so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The context of Numbers 21 9 is that at God's instruction Moses has made a bronze serpent so that those who have been bitten by one of the poisonous serpents sent by God, look we have to read the whole story, on the wilderness trek won't die. This thing was put on a pole and the one who looked at the bronze serpent on the pole did not die. Now, under the pen of John, and I'm sure in the mind of the Holy Spirit, the serpent on the pole is clearly Jesus on the cross. So John ends this event with a statement that aligns with the purpose of his writing at all. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. Nicodemus was brought into this saving relationship. What hope if we neglect so great a salvation? No one ever cared for me like Jesus is an old gospel song. I found it deeply moving when I imagined Nicodemus voicing these words. Jesus had entrusted Nicodemus with himself and given him the time to work things out. It could be you or I having the conversation with Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true
to pause this video for your own prayer and reflection. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings and, by following in his way, come to share in his glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let's go.